because there's there's a lot of digital work that does and you know everybody has the same tools and um right. and i i think it's the understanding you bring to it that, that i find very special so oh well thank you john i appreciate that timmy how are we doing can i move forward on the slideshow or not um i will let you guys know okay no problem okay. all right so we'll just keep vamping here yeah absolutely <laughs> So, um, uh, Timmy, would it would it help if I stopped the share and then restarted it? Um, no, if, if you guys let them you... let them get there, Scott. Um, okay, all right. So, uh, like technology wise, what would you say? What would you suggest for somebody that's doing the type of work that you're doing? I mean, if it, if it was a, a, like you know current students that you have. Uh, what are you telling them that they really should have under their belt or just even equipment wise? Uh, if you, yeah, if you want, good. Guys continue right now and we are good to go. Good. Okay. All right. Thanks to me. Okay. I'll answer that question and then I'll move forward with this. Um, so to repeat the question that John just asked of, you know, what, what tech would I recommend to students today? Um, so at Westmont at the college that I teach at, we have one of our core classes that's required for the curriculum of art majors is called digital tools. And the way we frame it in the syllabus and the way we describe it is this is their digital literacy class. And so what we mean by that is that we want that class to really solidly ground them in what we think are the fundamentals that are important, even if your main focus as an artist becomes that you're a, a ceramicist, you know, or you're, you're, you're doing some kind of like the output is completely analog, it's completely traditional materials, there's still an argument that you need to know how to take good photos of your work, how to photo retouch them, color balance, sharpen, resize for the web, resize for print, understand the basics of RGB, CMYK, you know, all that kind of stuff that you could argue that you could get away without knowing it. But if that's going to be the case, then just be aware that you are now resigning yourself to forever paying somebody to do that for you. And not all artists are going to have the kind of margins in their profitability to, to be able to have that, you know, be, be part of their, their cost uh, workflow, so to speak. So we, we do think it's really important that even our artists that are very committed towards like a more traditional, you know, fine art based outcome for what they want for their career. That's totally fine. There's a certain element that you've got to have a certain amount of digital literacy that we just think is important. The good news, I think, for students today is that any any student who's you know age 20 or younger you're digital natives you know um you you've you've known a world only with touchscreen technology you know um you, or you probably don't remember well the times you know when you were really little when that that technology wasn't there yet so for most of our students we're finding you know insisting on some level of digital knowledge is rarely a problem they're usually pretty drawn to it and they're pretty comfortable with it but I do think a certain amount of, even if you just wanted to distill it down to just one program, Photoshop, you've got to know a certain amount of Photoshop to be able to retouch your images, even if you're just creating it traditionally and scanning it. You want to be able to color correct it, to sharpen it, fix it up so it's print ready, it's ready to roll. So then you can either upload it to a server and send the download link or just you know send a, a high-res JPEG to your art director. Um, certainly, I think the days of art directors requesting Original artwork, I, I heard from one artist once that there are still some of the children's book companies that they actually still supposedly prefer for artists to send in their original artwork if they're doing paintings and then they'll handle them, you know, getting photographed and, and all that. And I suspect if that's the case, it's because they probably have some artists that they just don't trust to get good enough quality reproductions of their work. But I know certainly in the editorial world, if I were to ask an art director today for their FedEx so that I could send them the painting, I'm sure they would just be completely baffled. They'd be like, whoa, what? Like, what, what, what did you what mean? What, do what are you doing? They got it. Yeah. yeah. What yeah, would they exactly. do with they, it? They, yeah. Exactly. So you're you're certainly going to be expected if you work analog to have a good scanner and a good way of, of capturing your artwork, whether you're photographing it directly with a camera or scanning it. Okay, right, let me go you. back to my beer here. Yeah. All right. So I'm just going to show you. I, I'm a lucky enough guy that, well, this is my workhorse Cintiq. I, I actually have another one, which is one of the newer ones. This is a smaller size one. And I literally, uh, I told the story at the last slideshow, I, I won this basically in a, in a portrait contest. 
And so, yeah, I have the second one, which I do break out occasionally while the screen size isn't as large. Um, it's got a little bit higher resolution and I think the color matching on it is just a little, little bit better. So I've got kind of an embarrassment of riches and it's probably time for me to let go of one of them. Um, but that said, these days now, I'm finding for my digital work, my, my editorial work, probably 90% or more I am doing on the iPad. And often it will be part iPad, part Cintiq. So shuttling files back and forth, I found to be really, really easy just using drop, Dropbox to move them back and forth between the two. And as long as you're working in sRGB as your um, RGB mode for both the iPad and Photoshop, then the colors can stay dead consistent. You're not gonna have to worry about color shifting or anything like that. So this is, um, those of you who know your iPad Pros will recognize this is the second generation iPad Pro. So it's an older one. It just happens to be one where, you know, I took this, this shot after finishing a piece to kind of show that this piece in particular was created 100% in Procreate uh, on the iPad. And for a while when Procreate first came out and even when the iPad Pro came out, the Apple Pencil came out, there was kind of this thing going on uh, amongst illustrators that I was seeing online of like, oh yeah, it's great for color sketches. It's great for, you know, doing digital sketching if you're on vacation, like, like for fun. It's not really equipment for, for serious finished work. And I remember as soon as I sensed that idea of just kind of going, why, why not? Like, it seems pretty robust to me. I mean, it seems only it's, it's only going to be limited by the, the user or the user's willingness. And I think some of those artists, they didn't mean that you couldn't do finished work on Procreate. I think they were just seeing with the advantage of hotkeys and some of the other features of the Cintiq, like, well, why would you wanna to switch to a smaller screen and all this? And I'll tell you guys why for me. Um, the key thing that made me a pretty early adopter of going to Procreate and doing my work on the iPad Pro was the portability. And specifically the portability, even when I technically didn't need it, which is to say, I really enjoyed the fact that if I was working on an assignment, I could go out to the couch in our living room where my wife and kids are, and I could be hanging out with them and still chatting with them and enjoying their company while you know picking away at a piece and making some progress on it. Uh, obviously not making the kind of focused progress I'd be making if I was locked away in my home studio, um, but just that ability to be working out on the couch would allow me on a lot of nights if the deadline wasn't tense, to make progress on an illustration and kind of not have it feel as much like work. And for me, psychologically, that was a huge benefit. I liked the fact that it, it made my work just that little bit more fun. And then it's also helped when you really need portability of there have been a couple of times, you know, just going on family vacations or whatnot. I try to not take work on vacations, but sometimes that's when a really, really good job offer comes through. Sometimes that's when a client you've been chasing for a while finally calls. And so you want to take advantage of it. And the iPad Pro has allowed me to, to do that really easily. It's just, it's the most compact digital studio one could ask for. So very, very bullish on, on the iPad, especially the, the latest versions of it. Um, now that it's, you know, they've gotten rid of the home button and given you the larger screen with a smaller bezel, just a great, great piece of gear. And this is what's really been a huge secondary part of that. So if you're not familiar with this and you like to draw on the iPad, I am changing your life right now because, um, and I should note, I am not endorsed by these guys um, and I should be because I've, I, I know <laughs> I have sold these on their behalf at this point. I've converted some friends. This is called the Sketchboard Pro. And the Sketchboard Pro was developed, it was a Kickstarter product by um, a team and I'm, I'm uh, blanking out on the name of their studio, but they're like a, a game design and animation based studio. And they were all huge fans of working on the iPad Pro. And they realized that they wanted something that was a little more ergonomic. They wanted something that would have a kickstand so you could prop it up at an angle on your desk. And then the, the real genius move that they made is they made a cradle for it so that the iPad sits flush to the board. So imagine this is like kind of your classic like figure drawing clipboard. It's similar to that, but it's got a sunken cradle that your iPad fits into. And then they really measured it out perfectly. So then the, the surface of your iPad and the surface of the board are completely just seamless, flat. So what this means then is you can be drawing and here, I don't, I'll try and kind of pose here with mine. Your hand can be resting on the edge of the board, which means then you're actually now taking full advantage of the space of your iPad. Whereas beforehand, you wouldn't have been because if you're just holding it in your hands, it's a little more cramped of an experience. And, you know, there's only so much 
pardon me, there's only so much room for your, your hand to rest on the iPad. This extends that. And the, the kickstand legs you see there just pop right up in the back. So you can also just prop it on your lap. You can have it on your lap and then you know braced against a desk. So you can change your angle of working, which obviously helps just with you know neck pain and back pain and stuff if you're doing long sessions at the board. So I am a huge, huge fan of this thing. I just, from the minute I received it in the mail, I just fell in love with it. And, and here's some pictures of it. This is the day I got it. So I just immediately pulled out the iPad, pulled up some reference and just started doing a painting for fun. And uh, you just had the best time with, with having this propped in my lap, sitting out on the couch in my living room. So um, huge fan of this to the extent that there is now a competitor that released another one on Kickstarter called the Dark Board. And their uh, kind of innovation of it is it's like a really lightweight um, foam core. So it's a little bit lighter. And that was the key thing that attracted me to buy that one as well. And apparently it's going to ship in like a couple of weeks. I just got a, another Kickstarter notification about it today. My only critique of the um, Sketchboard Pro and literally my only one, it's just, it's a little heavier than I'd like it to be. You know, if it was just a little bit lighter and I have the utmost confidence as they continue to make these, and I, I'm sure a lighter version will come out someday and I'll, I'll buy that too. But for now, I like the idea of this dark board, even though it doesn't have the kickstands on it, apparently it's super featherweight light. And I just thought, you know what, that'll be the one I'll keep at my office here on campus. So I've always got one of these boards available and then my, my uh, Sketchboard Pro will stay with me at home. So I'm, I'm just that much of a glutton for this stuff that I'm gonna actually, you know, have two different brands of the same thing. Looks helpful. Yeah, there. I mean, literally, even if you're, if you just like using the iPad just for fun for painting, I, you know, I think they're like 120 bucks. I think it's worth it. It's it's just a just a great great piece of uh, equipment. Okay, there's the dark board apparently. So I, I swiped that off their Kickstarter. So you can see that kind of, uh, you know, it's the same same idea behind it, um, but just yeah, this this lightweight kind of dense uh, foam core basically, or not foam core, but like a like a foam board, you know, type like like athletic stuff, you know, material. I think. Uh, okay, here's the other piece of gear that I'm a huge fan of. So this is the pen pad. And if you want to look this up online, the company's name is Pen Tips because that's what they started with was little tips that would go on the end of your Apple Pencil. Um, their initial innovation was these tips that when put on the, the end of your Apple Pencil would give you a little bit more um, grip, like a little more grit. Because one of the complaints of people who use Wacom Cintiqs versus an iPad Pro, and it's a fair critique, is that the Cintiq has a slightly etched surface that gives you just a little bit of texture. And it's, you know, we're not talking pencil and paper here, but it's noticeable. You, you can feel the difference between drawing on a Cintiq as opposed to the iPad, which is obviously a much wider consumer base aimed product. And so, you know, they've got the slickness of their, their special type of glass. So um, try to mimic that, pen tips came up with these, these pen tips that would give friction. Well, I found the friction was way too intense. I, I bought a set of them and this is just me speaking. Um, it, my hand like literally fatigued. It, it was a little too much grip. So I wasn't as excited about that, but then they came out with this and this addressed the other kind of complaint I'd had uh, or the thing I was missing from working on the iPad Pro versus the Cintiq. So this is just hotkeys. It's just keyboard shortcuts. And the one I use like more than any other is the biggest key right here where my thumb is, is um, just the eyedropper. Because when you're digitally painting, after you've kind of established your, your color scheme and your piece, at some point you're just gonna sample from within the piece quite a bit as you're softening edges and blending and you know doing whatever kind of rendering things you're gonna do. So to be able to have a button I can press, as opposed to pressing the button on the screen where sometimes I would miss it, sometimes it sticks a little bit, it's just not as reliable. This thing is dead reliable. It's a uh, dead on reliable, I should say, like really, really reliable. It's got a great battery life to it, um, just charges on little side port here. I have not run it out yet in a, in a painting session. And uh, yeah, I, I just, it hasn't run out on me. I just, every you know four or five days, I'll charge it back up again, but it is great. And as you can see here on the screen, if you look at the slide, there's all kinds of cool options, sizing your brush up and down, pulling up the brush palette. You know, once you kind of get the muscle memory on it, it's, it's the equivalent of the hotkeys on your Cintiq in a really lightweight, super portable, 
little package here. So again, big fan of the, the pen pad and no, I am not sponsored by them, but I should be. Um, so there's the pen tips. If any of you are interested in trying that, like I said, I don't really go for that, but I do like their grip that they put on the pen. And some of you may be thinking, oh, but that means you can't get the double tap on the pencil. And you're right, you sacrifice that, but for ergonomic use and with the pen pad, I'm not missing um, losing that little double tap. I always find that double tap is actually not super um, reliable. Like sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. So I was fine with losing that functionality. And then they just made recently their own um, screen, like their own screen protector. And I had always been thinking about getting, I forget the brand, but there's one brand that's been kind of dominant for a screen texture that, you know, does give a little bit of that nice tooth to the screen of your iPad. And I was always scared to try it because I would read the reviews on Amazon and people would say how, oh, it works great, but you got to get the bubbles out. And it's like such a hassle getting the, the bubbles out. And I just knew that would drive me nuts. I'm just OCD enough that having like a bubble on the screen would drive me insane. So when this one came out, what really attracted me to it was the fact that it's magnetic. So it comes on and off your iPad, super easy, piece of cake. And there's it's a thick enough texture, there's absolutely no bubbles ever. Like that's just not ever gonna be a thing. But then it's removable for when you're using your iPad for other things, if you just wanna you know, read and you don't really need that, that slightly frosted surface. So big, big fan of that new. And I think that that's, I think there's already another product I've seen that's basically swiped their idea of having these magnetic edges. So that's going to be the new normal now for these kind of screen protectors. And I do very much appreciate the, the little bit of grit it gives on the Apple Pencil, it makes it much more like a Cintiq-like experience. So between that screen protector and the pen pad, the, the few things that I had seen is, you know, the, the point towards the Cintiq they're, they're fading. I mean, there's still certain things that Photoshop is just way better for than Procreate. Um, certainly if you're using transformation tools and things like that, there are some specialized filters, certain things that you, you still wanna go back to Photoshop, but man, with this kind of equipment, the iPad really becomes a pretty formidable um, piece of tech to, to get your work done. So that's what the screen protector looks like in the box. So you can see there's the, the pen tips branding that you can Google to find their website. You should. And then uh, <laughs> I know I really should. Here's the one other thing. I bought this on a whim. They were claiming that they had this like magic pad that does especially well at um, wiping off your screen, you know, cleaning smudges. And again, uh, I was like kind of <laughs> bought it on a whim and thought I'm probably going to just find this is essentially a, a suede rag, right? Like no big deal. They're it, they weren't kidding. Like this thing really gets smudges and fingerprints off even without having like a, a spray or anything on. So for having something that's dry and portable that I can keep in my little iPad saddle bag, little carrying bag, this, this thing's great too. So big fan of that. Um, okay, then I'm going to address brushes briefly because I know a lot of uh, student artists in particular, this is something that's always uh, very much eagerly on their mind. So if you're painting in Photoshop today, there's so many free brushes you can get online and I've got several of them. Um, I know there's a concept artist. I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name right, but Jama Jurabayev or Jurabayev. Um, he's got a free set of brushes that are floating around. Um, and those... Wait, is that how it's pronounced? I I, I, I think so. I, I, well, I've met Jama a couple of times. He's amazing. Um, yeah. And I've always heard it pronounced that way and I won't, and I'm probably torturing it, but. Okay. Okay. But yeah, but anyway, so we're talking about the same guy though. You know, he's worked on Star Wars it's, and stuff and, I, you know, and an incredible it's, I artist. Think it's, I think it's Yama. Um, oh, Yama. Okay. That would make sense. Yeah. Well, anyway, his brushes that are floating, you can find them for free. Just Google, like they're posted all over the internet. And he, my understanding is he willingly, you know, they weren't swiped from him or anything. You know, he he posted them. So there's some good stuff in there. But then also, as you can see from the slide here, I'm a big fan of Kyle Webster's brushes. And Kyle's a friend and he does amazing stuff. And I, I am still very much a student of learning his brushes. So... I've made a point of it. If I have a deadline that has just enough room on it, then that can be a time where I'll be like, well, okay, I'm going to investigate, you know, these brushes, you know, and then I'll, I'll try and play around with certain ones, trying to find new ones that I, I like, because like his watercolor pack alone, it could take you a month of practicing daily with it, I think, to truly get a handle on what each brush does, because there's just so many of them. It's just, it's an immense uh, pack. 
And I'm sure anybody watching this knows, but if you don't know that, these come free with your uh, Adobe Photoshop subscription. So if you have a subscription for Creative Cloud, all you have to do is go to the little flyaway menu in your brushes palette that says get more brushes and that will lead you to this page where then you can download the entire Kyle Webster library in which he adds to quarterly. He's every quarter he releases a new batch of brushes. So it's, it's a staggering amount of brushes. I mean, just that alone will keep you busy for a long time. For the iPad, so that's for Photoshop and Cintiq. For the iPad, I've become a fan of Jing Sketch. So this is an artist by first name of Jing. I can't remember his last name at the moment, but his uh, Procreate Br Brushes Complete collection I'm a fan of, and I think is a really great value at 15 bucks. So I, I would recommend those. You will see me use a couple of those brushes in today's demo, just as kind of basic brushes that I used to use as like a workhorse to at least start the piece. Uh, I, I use his all the time. And then I'm also a fan for, um, the iPad of the Max Packs, which are made by an uh, artist named Max Ulickney, who's a terrific illustrator, fantastic illustrator in his own right, and then also really, really good at uh, brush development. He's really figured out how to make brushes work for Procreate's engine specifically. So he has a gouache pack, and then he also has a watercolor, uh, as he calls them, Max Packs, um, that I think are, are really excellent. So if you're looking for those kind of looks to your work though those are two that um i highly recommend that i and that's not to say that i don't recommend his other ones i just haven't tried the other ones i just only have the gouache and the watercolor max packs but both of them are great okay so that gets us to for any of you who are sitting here going man is this guy ever going to paint or is he just going to talk about it um we're going to get to it here so well, Scott, that was really helpful thank you yeah okay great um, what I wanted to show you guys here, I mentioned this last week in my process slideshow, but in case anybody didn't see that, or just as a reminder, I really do prefer doing sketches on paper whenever possible. So last night I sat down, um, I was trying to figure out what to draw, and I had just recently discovered a resource called fancaps.net, I think it is. And it's a website where people are taking HD screen caps of movies and then uploading them to a site. You can just search by movie. And at first, when I discovered it, I thought, oh, sweet, I'm gonna go find some classic film noir movie and get a cool screen capture from that. Do you know something from really great reference from like a Hitchcock movie or something. Well, apparently the, the user base for this website is youthful enough that they have not uploaded any of those classic movies yet. I couldn't find any, but they had more recent stuff. And so one of the ones on the homepage just like two days ago was uh, that they had just uploaded screen caps from the latest Doctor Strange movie. And I thought, what the heck, let's, let's do that. So let's do Benedict Cumberbatch here as Doctor Strange. That could be something fun to play with. So my technique here is you can see there is a red pencil drawing in Prismacolor. And then I go over it and tighten it with an indigo blue Prismacolor pencil. And so by just doing that on the same drawing, um, the blue becomes my refinement stage, you know, so I can try and, you know, make corrections on the fly right there without having to get a sheet of tracing paper or whatever. I just work right on top. And what has become an accidental technique through doing this is that then when I scan it in RGB, bring it into Photoshop, when you click on the channels palette, the red information will show up in the blue channel and the blue pencil information shows up in the red channel. And how or why that is, it does make sense, but I'm not gonna get into the explaining of it. Just, just go with it and you can trust it if you wanna try this out. But what that allows me to do then is then just click on the red channel, which would just shows me the refined blue drawing. And then I can make a grayscale image from that so that I just have my refined lines. So in other words, it's like my first rough sketch just disappears and it drops out like instantly. There's no, doctoring or fine tuning of it. It's like, just click on that red channel, make it a grayscale image. I now have a grayscale sketch that's just the refined line work, which makes it nice and clean. And then that's what I, I then convert it back to RGB just so I can add color to it, but it still stays looking like this. And that's what I uploaded to my iPad here. And I'm going to now switch sharing here um, if I can. <laughs> Let me figure out. So Timmy, I'm only seeing, oh, there we go. Sorry, I just oh, had to- We're there. This, uh, okay, so I'm gonna go to screen sharing on my iPad here and we'll uh, we'll get going on this thing. Um, <clears throat> Scott, when you have a, a pause and when you, when you start rendering and 
you can render and talk. I have a question that's art director related. Great. Okay, yeah, let me just uh Yeah, I don't want to bother you, bother you now. Okay. Um so we good? Everybody able to see <laughs> what I've got uh I'm, I'm hopeful this is the main screen now. Okay, cool. Yep, All right, good. so here we go. So the first step, let me just explain what I'm doing first and try and figure out why my Apple Pencil isn't working when I had just charged it earlier today. There we go. Sometimes it just needs to be told to reconnect. And there we go. Okay, so first step is take the sketch and set it to multiply. And so the reason why I do that is because multiply, if you're not familiar with it, will drop out white. It's kind of your, your quick magic, make white transparent. So it doesn't look any different right now, but it means then I can take this layer number two and place it underneath. And this is where I'm gonna lay my color flats. So just to start things out, I always like to just lay down some flat color. So this is one area that um, I really give the advantage to Procreate as opposed to Photoshop of you'll, um, I know you guys can't see my hand moving, you're just seeing the, uh, the selection marquee here. But one of the things I love about Procreate is in Photoshop, you can't stop drawing when you're making a selection. Like if you're selecting with the lasso tool, you have to just keep going. Procreate actually lets you like lift your hand, which allows you to then, you know, rotate your screen as you're going around. Um, it's one of those things that it's such a great, thing that you can kind of start and stop and then pick up again with your selection that I'm amazed Adobe hasn't copied them on it yet. And pardon me guys, if my, my voice starts getting a little haggard here, um, this is my big teaching day at the college. So I've already taught two two hour classes today before coming on. So I'm gonna keep uh, drinking water here, but I can already hear myself getting a little haggard. Okay, so just go around here. And I'm just trying to block in just a very simple, simple silhouette, right? So really you could argue just about any color I want would, would work here. I've kind of got a vision for this one. I'm gonna paint just to be all illustrator cool and everything. I'm, I'm gonna um, paint Dr. Strange with like blue skin, you know, just to make him a little, make this more like an interpretive portrait and also maybe make it look like he's in, snowy land or something. So I'm gonna pick kind of like a muted blue here and then you can just select that and just drag and drop it. So there we go. And you can see the reason I can see this color, this paint layer, which let me go ahead and rename that. We'll just title it paint. And then we've got the sketch right there. So, um, and the sketch is set to multiply. If I set this back to normal, you would see it's opaque right on top, but at, take it to multiply, the white drops out, and now you can just see the line work on top. Um, what I've gotten in the habit of doing, for a long time, I used to paint basically under the sketch because that's one of the, the kind of like complaints of working analog, right? Is that you're gonna lose your drawing at some point. And if you're nervous about losing the drawing, you know, that can be a little intimidating. When you're working digitally, you don't have to lose that drawing. That said, I've also found sometimes the drawing is obscuring part of the painting in ways that I'm not wild about. So what I've kind of found is like a new halfway measure here is I'll take the sketch and I'll duplicate it and I'll turn off the top one. So the top one now is that top sketch is my safety layer, so to speak. Like I have that sketch there. I can come back to it if I need it. But what I'm going to do is now take this sketch, the, the bottom one, and I'm gonna lower the opacity way down. So I'll knock it down to something like that and then fuse that with the paint. So I'll merge that down. So again, just to explain what I did. I just knocked down the opacity of this sketch and merge down. So now that way that's just all its own layer. So I can paint on top of my sketch here and cover it up as I go. But then if I get in trouble, let's say, you know, I goof up the eye or the nose or whatever and feel like it's not looking accurate anymore, I can still bring that sketch back. I rarely need to bring it back, but I'm just nervous enough of a person that I, I do it that way, so. Um, okay, John, why don't you far away with whatever question you have, because what I'm gonna do now is just paint right on top of this layer. I'm gonna grab a brush from my um, okay. brushing paint here. The Sharp Render brush is the one I've got, and I'm gonna start by just laying in darks. 
is, is kind of my first uh, technique here. And you're gonna occasionally see things happen like the eyedropper coming up and that's me sampling using my little pen pad here. So if you hear any little clicking that my, my AirPods are picking up, that's it. As well as I've got a, a hotkey button to be able to pull up um, the color palette like this. So you're gonna see stuff kind of moving around here. And of course, I'm gonna zoom in and out of the reference. Um, but I can probably answer some questions here while I pick away at this. Okay. Um, well, this one is maybe uh, kind of left over from last week or part of what we talked about. But uh, I have a question. When it comes to establishing working relationships with art directors, what are some of the biggest tips in developing these connections? Be nice and be personable. I, I really think that that's a big part of it. Um, there are some art directors who will actually like to talk on the phone after, you know, almost all the jobs these days are initiated via email, which I appreciate because then, you know, that way you can respond in your own time and all that. But um, there will be some art directors that occasionally just want to talk on the phone because that's, that's how they like to work, you know, so you want to find their kind of communication style. But even if you are just going via email, I think, you know, you want to, of course, just general ideas of professionalism, right? Um, a case in point, for those of you who tuned in last week, I showed you guys a job um, from LA Times that I think ended okay, but it had some stressful moments and, and an editor that wasn't quite quite feeling my vision on it, you know? So um, I had to adapt to, to match her vision. And one of the things was as well, it was happening over Christmas break, right before Christmas. And so, you know, with the job over, even if the art directors were to hear this now, I, I think they would understand if I would say that, like, it was it was a bit of a hassle I wasn't looking for in my life for the editor to be as uh, picky about the likeness as she chose to be. But that said, I mean, they're hiring me. It's 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 my job to deliver what they're asking for. And so it was just a good reminder to myself of like every time I responded, I made, I added in like extra cheerfulness and extra kind of can do attitude to um, my responses because I didn't want it to slip out that I was a little irritated that you know it was over the holidays and I was having to sweat this likeness and you know put in all this extra work when I had already put in quite a bit of extra work, um, you know just getting it done right before Christmas and with, with all that involved. So um, my hope is that that professionalism is what's going to save the day and have them hire me again, and time will tell. Um, but if I don't get hired again, I know at least it won't be because they thought I was a jerk. I, I, I took pains to make sure that there's no way that that's, that's going to be the reason. It'll, it'll be because they, they weren't pleased with the, the likeness, and not much I can do about that at this point. Thank you, Scott. Scott? Would, would you add anything to that, John? I mean, you know, from, well, from your- No, your maybe assistant. part of it, I mean, um, establishing a working relationship. I mean, that could be just making making the introduction. That could be how you, how you uh, originally interacted with them, how you got their attention. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think you what you said was probably after there was a connection made. Uh, oh, I see. Yeah, so you're talking about like developing that connection. Right. Um, yeah, well- so my main way of, of promoting myself, it used to be postcards, you know, along you know, with, every, with every other illustrator. And I still think that that's a valid way of, of getting the attention of an art director. And the nice thing about a well-done postcard, I would always make mine five by seven. I wanted to make sure it was compact enough size that it's, it's not obnoxious for them to receive. And hopefully it's just sizable enough for them to see the image well, and um, but also can easily be taped up to you know a corner of a desk or you know some art directors have like a cork board for that kind of thing or for mood boards or whatever. Um, I have not sent a postcard in a while because as I've been corresponding with my art directors, I am stunned by even as we are post pandemic, there are quite a few of them that are still not back in the office. So I think we're maybe just at a point now where you know it might not be a bad idea to um, see. I gotta brighten up my screen here. Um, might not be a bad idea to um, send a, a physical postcard, but certainly for the last two years, it would have been an absolute wasted effort because they, they never would have seen it. So I just send emails. That, that's that been kind of my oops, um, my, my way of, of, of doing it. And I just keep it short and sweet. And then um, 
yeah, I, I just send them targeted emails that, that, you know, check in every now and then, even with people I, who haven't responded, but just trying to trying to sound and act professional and just, hey, I just, I'd love to work for you someday. And I think it's important in the email, if there's something you can do that just shows them a little bit that you, you aren't just sending a form letter, you actually know what you're talking about. So um, if you're following illustrators on Instagram, say, and they um, mention working with a particular artist, maybe you write that down, like in your notes app or something like that. I'm like, oh, I you know, saw that John Krause worked with Jim Cook over at LA Times. And then you can compliment Jim on that as you send your email, like, hey, saw the piece you did with John Krause and it was so cool. And, you know, I mean, who isn't going to be flattered, right? You know, if we just kind of play off of human nature a little bit, I think showing people that I'm aware of work you did and I thought it was cool. Maybe there's an art director or two out there who will think that that's uh, um, not the way to play it, but I, I would bet that most of them would be pretty pretty flattered. So it's that that's a gamble I'm, I'm willing to, to take on it. And then um, you just sit there and you hope. And one thing I will reiterate to people of, I'm amazed sometimes how marketing ploys, whether it's an email or a postcard, sometimes they are truly like, it's like time delay bombs. And I don't know if that's the right way to talk about it, but like, hopefully you get, you get the metaphor I'm saying of like, it, it can be a long payout sometimes. And I have had multiple instances where an art director has called me and I've said to them, hey, um, what, what made you think of me? Like, because I'm curious to know, like, what's working in my marketing? And I can think of at least two uh, occasions where they were like, oh, well, you know, I've had your postcard that you sent me a while back. And in both cases, the postcard, in one case, I had sent to the art director five years prior. And the other case, it was six years prior like where they, they identified the postcard that was, you know, sitting on their desk. And I knew when I had mailed that, it was like, holy cow, it just, it sat there they, for that They really long. liked that postcard. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, obviously, yeah. Years. And 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 they they really thought to themselves, oh, I got, I got to work with this guy sometime. And it just took that long before finally there was that like right job, right? Um, another case in point, I did, um, I did a portrait of the Big Lebowski for LA Weekly for Derek Rainey, who was great. We got along great. And, super nice guy, great art director, like really smart art direction that he gave on that job. But there was one little hiccup on it where um, we had had a miscommunication where I thought, I mean, I really could have sworn that I thought he wanted me to paint Lebowski in his um, purple robe that he wears, you know, when he goes to the grocery store and he's just lounging around the house, he's kind of got this terry cloth purple robe. And Derek was dead certain. He had told me, no, 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 I want him to wear like the alpaca sweater that he also, you know, what he wears when he's bowling or whatnot. And so I turned in the job and uh, did it with the robe. And understandably, our director's like, what the heck, man? Like, we talked about this. And, you know, it was just <laughs> my, my memory and his were completely different. So I quickly, um, you know, got right back to work and I, I got him the corrected file within an hour. But still, of course, I was mortified because I thought, oh, my gosh, if that really was on me, if I goofed on the communication there, then, you know, that it, obviously that looks bad. I feel silly right now. So I didn't hear from him for a long time. And I just thought for sure, like, oh, you know, sometimes it's just a little thing like that. A little mistake can be enough that an art director just has a slightly uneasy feeling about you. And when there's so many talented people out there, who's going to want to work with somebody that they feel a little uneasy about, right? Like, I get that, you know? So I had kind of thought, oh, okay, no more LA Weekly. And then in 2016, he called me and gave me a career changing job when he had me do their best of issue that featured all these portraits of Hillary and Trump. And we got to do all these funny scenarios. And I poured everything I had into that job and it got me work at the Hollywood Reporter who I'd been trying to get work with. And it got me my first acceptance into communication arts. And, you know, so Derek came through me for me in a, in a huge way but it was several years later, you know? So sometimes, you know, an art director, it's not that anything went wrong and they'd be happy to work with you again. They just, sometimes they want to, they want to date other people. And then the, if you, if you were kind to them, they'll, they'll come back to you. I have this, uh, people have, have asked this to me a couple of times, uh, Scott, that if, is there a way we can get a list of the products that you talked about? Um, oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. I'll make up a list. I'd be happy to. So yeah, I'll, uh, I'll make up a list and I'll like make a PDF of it and post it to discord or something like that. So for those who are, we'll, we'll use that as the true believer status. If you're involved with the discord chat, then you'll be able to see it. And yeah, I'm more than happy to do that. I'll, I'll provide links the whole bit. 
So make it make it real easy for you guys. And then I want somebody buying a product to make a point of telling them that they heard about it from me so that these guys will start sponsoring me because at this point I have well earned uh, some free products for how many of these things I've sold on their behalf. Does that work, John, or would you rather we do it a different way? So it looks like we lost John. Timmy, I'm assuming you and I are still live? Yeah, we are. We are all good. Okay. Okay. I can keep painting, but yeah, it looks like John either got booted off or uh, maybe he just finally decided he has just had enough of my nonsense. <laughs> I think you're okay it. though. He'll be back on in a second. <laughs> okay. Um, Timmy, any questions from like the discord or anything that I could answer while we're, while I'm we'll away at this? Check. while Timmy is checking to see if there's any questions. Um, my plan right here is to just get a little bit further with just kind of establishing the darks. And then um, once I've got that set, I realize there's a step that I often take that I forgot because, you know, this is a little bit nerve wracking to be doing this kind of demo in front of uh, a bunch of really talented artists. So I forgot one step that I have been doing of late, but it's very easy to add in. So I'm going to show that in just probably another five minutes or so. I'll kind of have the dark established. Here's a here. question from somebody watching on YouTube. Uh, okay. What, what would you identify as the darks specifically in this uh, image that you're working on? Where would you draw that line? Yeah, because obviously I'm I'm getting a fair amount of midtones as I go, right? Um, and that's a great example of like, you know, I can I can be operating off a principle and they'd be breaking that principle at the same time because hey, we're human beings and you know, as artists, we we can make our own rules and break our own rules. So for the most part, I would just say you know anything that's any darker than the midtone that I had initially defined, you know, that that's kind of my loose interpretation of of darks here. And you can see I'm I'm certainly um, it, it's a valid approach that some artists use where you might really want to make like almost like a poster study of it first and just make this all like really go for like a posterized flat dark values, you know, and then go in and start to introduce those midtones. Um, and I'm not doing that. I'm, I'm being a little more subtle than that. Um, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, guys, uh, I, I'm doing what feels instinctively right and trying to make sure um, I'm having fun. So there's this kind of uh, fine line that you you walk between making sure you're being just disciplined enough that based on your training and what you know is a good way to construct the image, you follow through on that. But then also at some point too, you you let instinct take over and just kind of you know go after what appeals to you or occurs to you feels like the the next right thing to to tackle um yeah i guess that's the best way i can say it but yeah anything darker than the midtone is kind of what i'm defining as dark so you'll notice i haven't put anything lighter than the midtone in yet you know there's definitely been some half tones here but um nothing lighter than that yet and that is very deliberate i will actually very much restrain myself in that regard i'm not going to add anything lighter until i um get this next stage that's coming up, which is that I'm going to add a little texture to this. I will also notice too, and this is me obviously speaking out of um, uh, probably misplaced pride, but um, normally if I'm doing an assignment like this for a client, I try to build in enough time with my kind of you know scheduling of handling the job, assuming there's this much time to begin with from the client. But like, let's say the client gives me a, a week or uh, if I'm lucky, more. 
if it's at least a week, and especially if it's like a portrait assignment, then I can afford to take an entire day to just burn on just doing drawings and literally just draw the subject over and over and over and over again until I really feel great about the likeness. And so I will freely confess to you guys between my teaching load and just other work that's going on, um, this is a case where I intended to do that kind of level of drawing of this on Saturday. And Saturday came and went as I had to work on some other stuff. And so finally, it was about 10 p.m. last night. I sat down where it was like, holy cow, I have got to get this ready. I got to be ready for this demo. So I'm not starting it from scratch and, and irritating people who are showing up expecting to see something happen. So this was a, a rare case of where you know, with doing a likeness, it's just a single sketch. And I think luckily um, it's a passable likeness, but I, I would not be one to claim that it's a, you know, a dead on likeness. I know with a couple more redraftings, I could get it a little tighter. And so while I'm trying to um, really evaluate the reference and make some of those changes on the fly here, as I notice them, I will confess that, especially as I'm, you know, just painting here on the go, I'm, uh, there's not a whole lot I'm changing. I'm mostly sticking to the scaffolding of the sketch and just, kind of letting myself um, be okay with the fact that it's it's not and not not a drop dead likeness of Cumberbatch, but good enough to pass for a fictional character, right? Yeah. Because after all, he, yeah, I think it's, Cumberbatch I mean, is perfect casting, but anyway. he's not he's not yeah he's not Ditko's you know Doctor Strange, and that that's really the true Doctor Strange in my opinion. But uh, right, Cumberbatch, so I think, is br brilliant casting. Got a couple of more questions for you. Um, okay. When getting started, was there a learning curve with avoiding burnout when you were getting started? How did you figure out how many projects to take on at, a, at one time and how often to take breaks to stay productive and mentally healthy? Great question. You know, um, I'm, I'm this. This is funny. You know, you would get a much different um, answer on this, I'm sure if you were to say, ask my, my friend Sterling Hundley, who, um, as John has mentioned, Sterling and I were, uh, were peers and students together at the Illustration Academy. So um, Sterling had that problem much, much, much earlier than I did of having to triage work. You know what I mean? Where, where you know, he, he faced that problem a solid decade, maybe 15 years earlier than I did, probably probably 12 years earlier than I did, of um, where I finally got to a point of enough work coming in where maybe I would occasionally start turning something down. So now I would say I turn down probably a couple jobs every year um, because I've gained the confidence now that one, I'm getting pretty good at sensing when an assignment is, is just going to be not a pleasant experience and and it might the art director might be wonderful but like um i'm thinking there was a job once that was offered to me by um tom carlson who's art director for phoenix new times and uh, i would like somebody i would consider a friend at this point and we we've worked together a bunch of times he's the nicest guy and um there was just one time he he approached me it was something to do with i was going to do kind of a reinvention of the camel cigarette packaging they were riffing off of that but they wanted to stay in this style that was much more kind of, um, it was calling for somebody with like a scratch board technique. And so I was pointing out to him like, hey, so you know what I do and, you know, I'm going to do like kind of a painterly version of this. So I can, or at least, you know, more painterly than the style that appeared to be called for. And so I just kind of made sure like, you know, no hard feelings if you want to get somebody who's maybe a little bit better fit for this. And he immediately came back and said, you're right. Yeah. What am I thinking? Yeah. Let me, um, I'm going to call you back, you know, sometime in the next coming months when, when I've got something where you can be you. And, and I just loved the way he said that, you know, I, I thought, yeah, that's, you know, you cast an illustrator the way you cast some, uh, a Hollywood actor, you know, it, it, there should be some element of that. Um, I'm going to move this eye just a tiny bit. Um, so all that to say, I'm comfortable now, more comfortable than I used to be with um, turning down work either because I don't think I'm the right fit or it sounds like it's a pain. I have also gotten a little bit more comfortable with turning down work when I'm just recognizing that um, I, I, I would be risking the very burnout you're asking about if I were to say yes to this job. I, I'm, I just think with time and experience, you start to learn your, your limits. The other thing I should note too, I'm in my late forties now. And so literally there's just like an energy issue, you know, like 
I, I remember Bart Forbes telling us, John, back at the Illustration Academy. So let's see, when when Bart visited, and it was in the late 90s, so I'm going to guess he was probably in his early 60s at that point, maybe? That'd be that about, right. about right. He's, he's yeah. roughly, I think he was about two or three years younger than my father. That's what I thought, yeah. So, yeah. so let's call it he was in his early 60s. And I remember there was one point where he acknowledged the late night deadlines, right? Like, you know, that they used to be. And then it was just very freely acknowledged to us that he was like, yeah, I don't do that anymore. He was like, you know, if if uh, the latest I'll stay up on working on any job is like maybe 11 p.m. And at that time, that blew my mind. Now, keep in mind, I was like 25 years old, you know, and I just thought like, oh my gosh, I, you know, going to bed at 11 o'clock would be like a miracle for me, <laughs> especially when working on an assignment because I was slow and, you know, I, I would just take every second for a job. Now I will occasionally do a, a late night if the deadline absolutely demands it. But I feel like I've just gotten a little more disciplined about doing the work. I've learned how to how to not take shortcuts, but just, you know, figure out a way to work faster, work smarter. Um, so it's it's pretty rare now that I'm staying up super late. But I, I also would say it used to be really habitual for me that every single night, like every night. I would have dinner with my family and then go into the studio and like close the door, put on my headphones and, you know, podcast or some music and then, you know, just work till 1 a.m. And there just came a point, it, it was before the pandemic, but there came a point where I suddenly realized like, if you're working the whole time thinking so it's that you can have a better life, at some point you got to ask yourself, when am I going to have that better life, right? Like at, at what point do you cut yourself some slack and say, this is the career I got. And maybe I'm not going to completely listen to the particularly American sense of what constitutes productivity and value and, and all that, you know. So these are the kind of things that as you get older, you just start to gain a little perspective. And I realized, you know, my kids are just going to keep on growing and I, I either can be there for them growing up or, or I can miss it. So I'm a lot better now about um, my default is typically I'm trying not to work at night. I'm trying to come home, be with the family, and then after that, you know, um, hang out with the family until the kids go to bed. And then when they go to bed, that's time for me to hang out with my wife or read or, uh, you know, catch up on my Netflix, you know, whatever I want to do. And occasionally that involves, um, you know, drawing for pleasure as well, drawing in my sketchbook or whatever. Um, but I guess that my long-winded way of avoiding burnout is just at some point recognize your limits don't fall too deeply into the American ideal of productivity for the sake of productivity. Like if you find yourself doing humble brags to your friends about how busy you are, recognize when you're doing that and then, you know, change, change your life. Like don't, don't, don't do that. Cause I used to be that guy who took, I think great pride actually in telling people how busy I was. Now I, I say it with a wince if, if, if it's ever the case, you know, somebody asked me and how life is going and it's busy. I, I say it very apologetically because I don't want it to appear that I'm trying to uh, gain self-importance or value through appearing to be busy. Well, Scott, I'm going to step on your, or rain on your parade a little bit. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, um, and my perspective is that's really smart. First of all, it's really smart. And I'm glad you've done that. I'm glad you are aware of that. And I, I know lots of people that have stepped back at a certain point when they could. Um, mm -hmm. The catch is getting started is pretty um, cumbersome. Yeah, you got to hustle. Yeah, you do. You got, you do. You got to so, hustle. There's, there's nobody that's good enough to not put in a ridiculous amount of time getting started. That doesn't mean kill yourself in the process, but you got to be right. real, you got to be really committed. Be as smart as you can. Yeah, and I, nobody that talented. Totally, totally agreed. So that's, and, and so everybody, please hear me here. That isn't me, you know, copping out on my answer. I, I will note that the perspective I was giving you now is one that's come from working enough to have at least somewhat established myself, you know, so I, I can, I can have that luxury, but yeah, when it was younger, I mean, if, if there was an assignment, the answer was yes. And I just figured it out, you know, and you just said yes to everything. Or um, there's actually something more you're assignments, getting. just getting good enough. You know, getting good enough. Right. To yeah. Listen. Putting in, putting in the time practice. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, I remember something that still sticks with me, John, the first year I went to the academy. So that would have been summer of 97. And there was one point where we were standing outside. It was on the campus of uh, William Jewell College in Liberty, Missouri, where we had the studio class.
classroom and everything. And there were a bunch of us hanging out, kind of getting to know your dad a little bit. And something came up on this very topic of just the kind of the relentless pace of illustration. And your dad very offhandedly said, yep, if you're not ready for 16 hour days, 16 hour work days, you know, don't be an illustrator. And that caught me short because I very much had it in my head that like a solid work day for an illustrator was like a 12 hour day, you know, and which, you know, for a lot of people by, you know, standards would that, that that's plenty hefty of a work day. And he said 16 and it just, it, the, it, it was the way he said it so casually too. And here was a guy saying that at that point in his sixties, you know, that man, did it catch my attention? I remember kind of going, Oh, oh whoa, whoa. I, I have to kind of grapple with that for a second. Like, am I ready for that? And once I analyzed it, I was like, yeah, I'm so all in on this. I'll, I'll do whatever it takes. But I was glad he said that because that was a sobering statement that I needed to hear at that time. Well, he was, he was kind of extreme on that topic. Um, it, you know, I, I think a lot of people would say he just was, I wouldn't say he was a workaholic just be, but because he enjoyed it so much. I think he, <laughs> when he, when he got mm -hmm. to a point mm -hmm. in his life where he didn't have to work, um, he worked all the time just because that was the thing yeah. that entertained him. Um, I have a couple right. more questions here. Thank you for the honesty on that. Um, Okay, I have a question about scanning and artwork. What should I look for in a scanner? Are there any that you recommend? Yeah, I mean, obviously, the more money you pay, the better you're going to get. So, right? I mean, it's just that simple. Um, that said, you're like, I don't know, I'm going to say even like a $200 scanner today. That is one of those areas that much as like, you know, your phone is now more powerful than any desktop you had eight years ago, you know, um, it's, it's going to be the same is true going to be of, of scanners. So um, funny enough, this scan that I'm the, that I'm working on the pencil sketch right here, um, this was done on an Epson, let's see if I can remember it, XP 4200. It's like an all in one printer. And I did not buy that printer with the idea of, oh, I get a you know a flatbed scanner on top of it as well. It was just it, it was the affordable Epson printer that was going to print fast just for when I need to you know print stuff at home. And so when I realized I, I just got a new computer over um, Christmas break and I have not fully fully finished dialing it in, so I have a nicer Epson scanner, like a dedicated flatbed scanner, and that's normally where I'd scan my sketches. And all of a sudden I realized like. I'm just scanning a pencil sketch to work on, you know, here, like who cares, right? I'll just use this, this all in one. And I have to say it, it's, well, it's not as good a scan as my dedicated Epson scanner. It was perfectly serviceable, you know? So that was a reminder of like, okay, even like the, the junky machine that you would normally not think of as being like a scanner is, is still doing like decent these days. So that's the good news is that if you're on a budget, my guess is that you can probably get a pretty decent one, 150, 200 bucks. That said, I have had the fortune of at Westmont at the college I work at, we invested in an Epson 11,000 XL a couple of years ago. I don't even know if they still make it or not, but that was at the time their highest end flatbed scanner. And it is like, it's amazing. I mean, just, just you, if you scan, say a watercolor painting or, you know, any kind of water-based painting that's on, you know, paper or illustration board or something, the the fidelity of it picking up the grain of the paper is just incredible. Like it's it's a really nice scanner. So that's also one that I'm pretty sure is a thousand dollars or more. So, you know, I I think it's nice to have, but it is not required. I mean, you can I, I guarantee you there are illustrators doing their work and scanning on, you know, a two to three hundred dollar Epson or Canon scanner and getting perfectly good professional results. So Shop around, ask around in your own network, see what people think. Um, I can't give you a specific number. I'm Epson brand loyal when it comes to scanners and printers, um, mostly because it's just something I'm super familiar with at this point, and I, I like the familiarity with the interface. Um, but a lot, a lot of good brands out there. Okay, another question here. Uh, I know you said you work, you would work 400 DPI or more when you are finishing your yeah. and say you want to send to a client but they need the size enlarged do you find it reliable to enlarge an image in procreate and send it off or do you have to take it over into photoshop or do you use something else great question i am nervous enough about what procreate is doing in terms of image interpolation and whatnot all that kind of stuff that i know the words 
for, but I don't actually 100% know what it means, that yes, I do bring it over to Photoshop if there needs to be any resizing. That said, I'm pretty careful of, it, it is rare if ever that an art director has surprised me with like a resize request because I ask that at the outset, I make sure I'm working to that size, I always build in ample bleed. And then yeah, based on how big the um, final is gonna be, I sometimes work at 400 DPI, sometimes I work at 600 DPI, just because at this point, the, the gear, the equipment can handle it and it doesn't really bog down the machine. So if it's not slowing things down, I just prefer having that, that you know, to, to resize if need be. And where that's really paid out is on the occasion, and it, it, it's only occasional, but it keeps happening on occasion, where somebody reaches out to me and says, hey, I saw this magazine piece. I saw this, you know, uh, independent Newsweekly cover that you did. Can I get a print of it? You know, and then they typically want the print, you know, to decorate their homes or offices. And they usually want it at, at a larger size than what I created for the client. So it's been nice to have that that leg room to resize it and make it larger. Um, so that that's where I, I try to work larger whenever possible, just to build in that that security. Good, thank you. I got another question for you here. This I think is a really good question, and uh, thank you for asking it, Nandu. Um, does the art director tell you how much detail slash rendering they want in the foreground and background? Do they reference your portfolio when doing this or other illustration? Um, in my opinion, the good ones do. You know, I, I love that when an illustrator, when a, I mean, sorry, an art director calls me and says, hey, so I want you to do this piece. I saw this piece. You know, sometimes just them saying that alone tells you like, oh, okay, that, that's what they dug. Like that's where they, they saw that in your portfolio and they're like, that's, this is what makes me think he's, he's the person for this job was that particular piece. So um, let me give you, let's uh, take a quick tour of my Procreate library here for a moment. So. If I were to show you, for example, you guys saw the Dave Matthews piece earlier in my slideshow. Um, that piece, if I recall correctly, was cited by Robert Priest of 8x8 magazine, who commissioned me to do this uh, image of um, footballer Memphis Depay. And this was for the Euro uh, 2020 um, tournament. And so what he told me on that, that Dave Matthews piece is probably one of the tighter likenesses I've done. So that's how I kind of heard it was like, okay, he liked that one. I'm going to like really chase after this likeness. And something that I had done on that Dave Matthews piece that I did here as well, if I zoom in, you guys see the grain that, that we have there on the image? Um, and that's partly a texture layer. Well, actually, it's mostly a texture layer right there that's just set to overlay. And it's, I have the texture loaded up and I was planning on uh, putting it at, as the final touch on my Doctor Strange piece. But that's a way um, to make it look like there's some little bit more, you know, traditional media there, right? Like that, that's, whoops, that's uh, part, part of what I was doing there in, in that particular piece. It was helpful to have a guide where, you know, I, I knew the art director maybe had a, a specific look or a specific piece of mind in, in mind. So I always appreciate when they tell me that because they might see something else that they feel is like a little more cartoony or something, um, since I, I vary between those things a little bit. Um, yeah, so. Um, okay, I got another one for you here. Mm -hmm. um, this is from Chuck Todd, Scott. No, hey, Chuck. Question. Last week when you were talking about the flamingo smoking piece, you mentioned a Photoshop mm -hmm. filter you used instead of a mul multiply and you it used for the drawing. I think you got a, a tip from a comic book, from the comic book artist, Mark Brooks. What was right. the filter technique? Thanks right. for the demo. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so I'll talk through it briefly here because it's it works a little bit easier, I think, in Photoshop. It, I will just make one small correction, um, Chuck. It, it's not involving filters at all. It was just definitely, uh, I would just call it like a, a, an approach. Um, but the main idea, let me see if I can. Um, so if you've got a silhouette like we've got right here on my paint layer, you can use that now as a selection. So the idea on that particular flamingo piece is, you may recall, there was a full watercolor painting that I had done, you know, like a full watercolor rendering with spattering and, and white paint and whatnot, but like a monochrome painting of the flamingo. So if we were to pretend this, you know, sketch layer for a minute was that, that like, you know, polished artwork, if you'll go with that as, as an idea for the moment. 
if you just do what I've done here, where you take black and white artwork like that, like that sketch layer, and um, set it to multiply, you know, take your black and white painting and then paint underneath it, it works. It's a way to colorize your drawing, but ultimately it just looks like a drawing that now has had, you know, like like watercolor put underneath it or something. It's it, it's still going to be pretty heavy on that initial multiply layer. What Mark's innovation was is that once he blocked in the flats for his pieces, he would use those as a selection. And I, I'm realizing I'm gesturing right now with my Apple Pencil, and that means nothing to you guys because you can't see it. But he would. Um, so let me just draw on a layer so that you guys can kind of see what I'm talking about. So he would make a selection, let's say, of the the face, you know, for like he would paint in a flat color for the face and select that. And then using that selection, he would create a hue saturation adjustment layer on the actual painting itself, if that makes sense. But making an adjustment layer means it could sit on top so you can adjust it, you could change it later. But it allowed him to change the color then of the actual, you know, line work. So some of these line work painted areas then, if you wanted it to be like a deep blue, you wanted it to be more of, you know, some some version of a flesh tone, you wanted, you know, whatever you wanted it to be, you could start actually altering the painting in that regard. And um, that then by changing the color of the painting itself and then still having color layers underneath it, you got a more holistic, like brighter color approach. Um, so ultimately, if somebody wanted to see me do a demo of that, well, then you just let John know so that he can say um, by popular demand and, and bring me back. And then um, I'll, I'll do another one of those someday. But yeah, it'd be a little tough to show on this because um, Procreate doesn't do adjustment God, I layers. <laughs> if you're, it's recorded. You said that. Yeah. Okay, I have another. I, I thought I thought you were going to tease me for making such an obvious transparent play to come back, but you, no, you, you didn't fall for it. it. So I love All it. Right. You're good hey, uh, before before you ask the next question, let me just show. I am going to finally, you know, just to make this a little little more uh, exciting here. Let me let me show you the other thing that I could have done before this stage, but it's not a big deal to do it now. And that is, um, I'm going to put an alpha lock on this briefly. So that just means I can only paint now within where I've painted, right? So like if I try to paint over here, it, it works if you're not on that layer, right? That is so bizarre. Why is it showing me doing that's I don't, that makes no sense. <laughs> it's not supposed to paint there. All right, well, I have the alpha lock on. And anyway, the idea should be I can only now paint like within, you know, the actual layer here itself. This is where I do like to add some texturing right at this stage as well. So I found a couple of different brushes that are good for it. Um, there are like spatter brushes that come within Procreate, um, spray paints and things like that. Um, I've just saved one here. There's a spatter and then there's this noise brush. I think I'll go with the spatter this time. But this is where now, literally, I'm just going to take a large brush here and just hit his face here with some spatter. And the key is to not like, go too nuts with it, right? You know, you don't want to get too carried away with it. But by doing that now, you see how we've got some grain and some texture here. So this would be the equivalent of, for those of you who watched last week, I mean, this is the digital equivalent of what I did with the, um, a Milton Glaser piece. So I've got mid-tones established, I've got some darks established, and now I laid down like a nice mid-tone spatter. I might do one more round of it with like one of my darkest values and just hit it again real briefly. But then this way, there's a little bit of, you know, it feels like skin texture. Um, when I was at the Academy back in the 90s, Chris Payne showed us his technique that we jokingly called the everything but the kitchen sink technique, you know, where it, it just it had acrylics and Prismacolor and India ink and acrylic washes. And, you know, it was just like everything was involved in this technique. But one of the advantages of this oil wash, the way it would settle in the illustration board, meant then that you would get this really cool Let's see, let me darken this up a little bit. Um, you would get this really cool bit of texture where the um, the the paint sunk into the board a little bit, right? And so with that, um, you you'd get a grain that that started happening. That was that was kind of cool. It was kind of fun. Um, this mimics that a little bit to give a little bit of grain, a little bit of tooth. And what's going to happen is I'm going to start building midtones all over this. So if anybody's looking at this aghast right now, going, "Holy cow, that's a lot of spatter he put on there," 
rest assured that a lot of it's going to get covered up. It's only going to really kind of continue to show up in some of the areas of like darker midtones because I'm going to start building highlights and stuff on top of this. Um, so enough of it are going to knock back that it hopefully doesn't become too much of like a shtick. Um, but it's just something I've enjoyed that helps to add to that kind of overall textured look a little bit. So I wanted to point that out and feel free to fire away with questions now, John. We lose John again? No, I still see him there. All right, well, John, if you can hear me, we can't hear you right now, so you may have accidentally muted. So I'll just talk until John comes back. But um, what I'm doing now is starting to add the, you know, the lighter midtones and, and highlight areas. And I try as much as I can to just be methodical and kind of gradually build it up. And there's no question that occasionally you'll just, um, you know, or at least I will sometimes just get kind of excited and ready to, you know, it's going to be super fun at some point to put that highlight on the end of the nose. So um, Steve Rude, who's an artist I was fortunate enough to get to just hang out with a lot in the early 2000s. And so there was kind of a, a light unofficial mentorship that happened between us. Um, Steve told me that uh, he had this teacher at his college, uh, an artist named Owen Campen, who was an illustrator back in the day. And um, he always very respectfully referred to him as Mr. Campen. And so he'd tell me Mr. Campen stories. And he said that uh, Mr. Campen always talked about highlights as dessert, that that was his metaphor for it. And, you know, just as in with life, like you, you got to wait till dessert at the end, right? Like eat the vegetables first and, you know, finish your dinner plate. And I have used that metaphor like a zillion times now with my own students. If any of my own students are watching, I'm sure some of them are laughing and nodding that they, they've heard me refer to that. Uh, you got to wait for dessert. Um, and yet I'm a hypocrite who breaks that all the time because sometimes I just see an area and you just get excited. You want to you want to see it come to life. So I'm trying to restrain myself here a little bit and build this nice and methodically. Timmy, is, is John just having all kinds of technical issues tonight? Do you know what's going on? Uh, yeah, it looks like he's just muted. Oh, okay. Um, but I, well, maybe he may have had to step away. Maybe something yeah. came up. So if you've got another question, you could read, Timmy. I, no, yeah, I, 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 I'm, I'm back. I apologize. Okay. Uh, my internet has dropped twice, and I really apologize. Oh, no worries. Yeah, uh, nothing you can control. All right. I've got a question for you guys uh, from YouTube. Any advice on what kind of style and pieces um, that you'd recommend when approaching the Criterion or, uh, yeah, Criterion Collection? Boy, great question, because, man, would I love to work for the Criterion Collection, right? I mean, that is a, talk about a murderer's row of illustration. And uh, I, I met Eric Skillman one year, um, let's see, it was in 2020. That's right. I was at the Society hanging out with Leslie Herman and Ted Kinsella and Ray Benilla. And at one point, Ray and I went on the patio and Eric Skillman came walking out and we just like immediately fanboyed out on him. So if you're, if you're not familiar, Eric Skillman is the creative director behind a Criterion Collection. And if anybody is listening right now going, what is this? Criterion Collection is a, um, like it's Blu-ray restorations of classic movies. And sometimes they're, you know, undeniable classics, but what Criterion Collection also specializes in is sometimes kind of helping to define the new canon of like, hey, here's an overlooked film that really, you know, should be considered a classic that they'll just just do this, you know, gorgeous new digital transfer of. And then they they put just a lot of love into the packaging. So um, in particular, um, Greg Ruth is somebody who has done some just like <laughs> jaw dropping Criterion work in recent years. And if you look at um, what Eric is curating for that, so he's used Sterling several times. He's used Greg Ruth. Um, he's used the comic book artist, Sean Phillips on a couple occasions. Um, you know, I, I think the reality is, is that, um, and he's used Yuko Shimuzu. So, I mean, Eric is clearly maybe more so than most art directors today. I think he's one of the most kind of like in touch art directors of that. I, I really think he's keeping his his finger on the on the pulse of the scene. Um, and he clearly has diverse tastes and they are excellent tastes. So 
You know, um, to answer that question, it's a very fair question and one, and boy, I'm sure trying to crack that code myself, but I'm, I'm ultimately convinced that the best thing I can do is just become the best Scott Anderson I, I can and just hope that one day <laughs> Scott Anderson's work is is appealing enough to him that, you know, he reaches out and, and wants to throw one of those projects my way. Um, I think trying to imitate uh, like a certain style. Well, you know, Greg Ruth gets a lot of work from him. And, you know, so Greg Ruth, for anybody who doesn't know his work, he does just stunning, almost photorealistic um, graphite drawings that then when he colorizes them in Photoshop, he's got this really unique um, Photoshop technique that's just amazing. And that I, I don't know the secrets of and would love to learn the secrets of sometime. And I, I think his work is just so original and innovative. And there is just no way that like, Copying Greg Ruth is going to be your right strategy, right? You know, he's Eric would see right through that in a heartbeat. He's not going to be interested in a Greg Ruth uh, imitator. He's going to be interested in somebody who's who's a true original in their own right. So I can't give you any better advice than that. I've just become awesome, and um, and then just don't be shy about showing your work. You know, find track down his email address and um, try and get your work in front of his face, and hopefully someday you, you get that call. That's that's going to be my strategy. Um, because yeah, fantastic work they do over there. Yeah, Eric is uh, special. He has a just a um, wonderful sense of uh, an understanding of um, illustration history. Yeah, and he tends, you know, he does a, and I think he does a as good a job as any of aligning the right artist for the project. I mean, he'll right. use a Sterling Hunley and a Greg Ruth, and then all of a sudden a George Pratt. Um, yeah, right, and, right. Yeah. And and uh I, I had a great evening with him and Sterling. Sterling um presented the um uh, Richard Gangle award to um uh to Eric, who which is the kind of best art direction um mm -hmm. of the year at the Society mm -hmm. of Illustrators. Uh, Richard mm -hmm. Gangle was the uh creative director for Sports Illustrated magazine for a very long period of time and was kind of iconic as an illustrator. So they named the award after him. Um, and I got to watch Sterling present that to them and then go after go out to dinner after with, with them and talk about illustration for hours. A really, really bright guy. No, that's so cool. Yeah, I just got to talk to him briefly on the patio. Um, and uh, yeah, Ray and I were trying to keep it in check, but we were definitely both like, dude, that's, that's him, you know, like, I mean, not only the chance to introduce ourselves, but also just to tell him, you know, how much we, you know, the guy has created such a body of work at this point. And these are such nice, both objects, but also they're doing such an important part of preserving American cinema, you know, that, um, yeah, it's the guy, the guy's doing, He's, he's doing work that goes beyond just, you know, cool graphic communication. I mean, he's, he's helping, his company is helping preserve um, cultural heritage, you know, and so it's, it's, it's really something. And I appreciate every now and then when they'll do a movie that I thought of, I've thought well of, but, you know, there's something about Criterion Collection sort of giving their, their stamp of approval um, on it. Like I was surprised, actually, I was a little bit surprised um, to see the Pixar movie Wall-E got um, a Criterion Collection that was illustrated by Jason Raish, who did a gorgeous cover for it um, just this last year. And, you know, that would not have been <laughs> on my list of like undiscovered classics. But the more I thought about it, I remembered I I'd seen that in the theater actually with my daughter at a showing where it was when my daughter was one year, one year old. And it was one of those showings where it's specifically for parents to bring their kids and you just kind of know going in like, it might get a little like might get a little noisy or whatever. And especially as a new parent, I was just profoundly moved by that movie, you know, so I had just kind of always attributed that to me being in, you know, sappy new parent mode. And it was kind of wild to see when Criterion, you know, sort of gave it the blessing of like, oh, no, okay, I guess maybe there was there was more to that movie than I was, you know, even giving it credit for. <clears throat> Can I just say too, I love John that you've got students out here that you know that they've they've got their eyes on the prize like that. You know that you're you're looking out for trying to work for Criterion. I think that's a very worthy client goal to have. But yeah, it's it's one most of the professionals in the industry are trying to. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. I I would say too, guys, like 
absolutely, I think it's good to have client goals, right? Like you, you should. And then also know like some of the best people in the industry never achieve their client goals. So I, I hope he'll be okay with me sharing this. I don't, I don't think this is anything scandalous or whatever, but I remember asking Gary Kelly one time, hey, have you ever worked for the New York Times book review? And this is back in the day where they were hiring Chris, like, you know, every third issue or something, they were hiring Chris Payne. And, you know, Chris is very contemporary with Gary. And uh, Gary told me, he was a little bit frustrated. He was like, yeah, I, for whatever reason, I don't think um, uh, uh, Steve Heller, you know, who's also on that, that list of, you know, great, great all-time art directors. But for whatever reason, doesn't appear that he really ever vibed with Gary's work. They, they never worked together, which is really stunning because, I mean, that would be one of the few, if any, mm -hmm. prominent art directors who didn't hire Gary. And, you know, at the end of the day, we have to allow that. People have their own individual tastes. And just because somebody's highly regarded, you know, by liter literally every other living human being in the industry, it just may not be ultimately your, your, your cup of tea. Um, but so that's well, where Steve you know, Helper's not as smart as he thinks he is. <laughs> okay. Oh well, throwing, throwing blows. <laughs> because, okay. Uh, because I, I, I'm I'm going to throw I'll throw a gauntlet down, and uh, mm -hmm. Gary Kelly's just. Oh my god. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I, totally, I'm, I'm, totally, I'm, I'm, I say that totally in jest too, because yeah, Steve Helper's right. a very smart guy, and right, right. has done great things for the illustration world, but. Um, uh, for whatever reason, maybe maybe it just never maybe there just there was an assignment that he thought was appropriate for Gary. I have no exactly. Idea. It, it could be as simple as that, right? Like, I mean, I, I I doubt very much if we were to get Steve Heller on the phone right now that he would say, "Oh, I've had a Gary Kelly blacklist for twenty years." You know, I, yeah. I do not think he, he would say that. Right. So, uh, but you know, it's just one of those things. And it was one of those where Gary obviously was a little bit like, huh, like, you know, I'd, I'd like to have worked for the guy. He's a prominent art director. It made sense. And at the same time, I guarantee you, Gary Kelly was sleeping just fine that night. You know what I mean? Like, it, you know, at the end of the day, um, set goals and then just make sure you don't um, define you know, self-worth by whether or not they're achieved because you might go on to a career that is amazing and you do incredible work and it just might be that Eric Skillman just for whatever reason either doesn't vibe with your work or just doesn't become aware of it enough or just loves it and doesn't think he's got the right project for you. So I just want to reiterate to people of have goals and um, also don't, um, I, I, I just hate the idea of somebody feeling like their life was a failure because they didn't, you know, ever work for Entertainment Weekly or whatever. You know what I mean? Like at some point, you know, cut yourself some slack and, and recognize if you're doing good work, you, you're we're not all going to get every client. I, I right. had a chance to have a Zoom interview with Nicholas Blackman at The New Yorker. Guys, I have very few illusions about doing a New Yorker cover because I truly actually don't know that my style is really a New Yorker cover style. I do think they they have a certain, even with the wide range of what they publish, I'm, I'm not convinced right. my work's ever a fit for that. But I do think my work could very much be a fit for an interior movie review or a you know, profile of an author or something like that. I, I think I could be a great fit there. Um, and I got lucky enough to have a Zoom interview with Nicholas Blackman last uh, summer. And I could just tell we got along great. I think he liked me as a human being. <laughs> and I'm <laughs> just not real real confident he's going to call me you know I, I don't think he was quite seeing it the way i saw it so right. i'm going to keep hammering away at that but i i also have to remind myself like yep the new yorker just may not be a client list that ever quite uh graces my my clientele list that i can publish on my website i, I may just have to be okay with that so there's a couple of things a couple of things i mean um the ma the magazine may cha change point of view too i mean they, they true true different there might be a rebranding uh, yeah. not, not, I mean, it's very successful. I, I, you know, it's not something I see happening like even right. amazingly, but, but, but quick, but, you know, Rolling Stone certainly took a different direction, you know, GQ took right. a, a turn, different direction. Um, you, you know, you, you don't know. You never know. No, that's, that's yeah. a very good point. And actually, I mean, honestly, so the cover editor for The New Yorker, you know, quite famously is uh, Francois Mouly, if any of you are not aware, she's an um, incredible art director and she's built quite a legacy of uh, provocative and attention grabbing covers. And she's, you know, she's been behind the helm behind many an award winning piece, right? So incredible art director. I also mentioned this as a side note and I truly want this only to be a side note because 
Francois has her own career that is, you know, <laughs> worthy of note and attention. She also happens to be the spouse of Art Spiegelman. So, you know, the two of them are quite, quite the, you know, power couple if you're talking in the, you know, illustration industry. Um, and Francois, I believe, I'm not going to, you know, say her age out loud, but I have a sense of how old she is. And, um, you know, some people go way, way, way past what's considered, you know, standard retirement age to, you um, um, you know, keep going because they love what they're doing and they're still good at it. So she may be one of those people. It's also entirely possible that in the next, you know, I don't know, I'm going to say five years or so, she she may retire. And at that point, there'll be a new cover editor. And that's a chance for somebody new to kind of stake out their own claim and not just try to be Francois right. 2.0, but make right. their own legacy if the magazine will allow them to do that, um, which they may or may not because, you know, Francois had a pretty winning formula for them. Um, so anyway, it'd be interesting to see when, when that changeover comes, because I, I think that will, it, it is going to happen eventually. And then, yeah, we'll see if, if a change happens there or if it's just, nope, we're going to kind of continue the, the legacy she started. Scott, this is a softball to you. Um, how long have you been doing art? <laughs> well, since I was three, I guess, you know, like all kids, right? I mean, uh, if the question is professionally, my first professional illustration uh, published date, I believe, boy, I used to know this cold. I think it was 2000 or 90. No, wait, what am I saying? No, it was earlier than that. It was, um, it was 98. The first thing I did that was published locally, I did a cover for the Santa Barbara Independent, which is our local news weekly, um, did a cover about the homelessness issue in town. And um that would have been, I believe, fall of 98. And then I did a couple more pieces for them. And then it was either fall of 99 or early 2000 that I got the call from Hispanic Business Magazine. I did a piece for them. And then I started working for Christine Morrison at um, Stocks and Commodities Magazine. And she would routinely give me a piece every two to three months. I'd get, get another piece from her. So. I did in total for Christine at um, Stocks and Commodities, I think I cleared over 20 pieces that I did for wow. her over a number of, of years. Yeah. Yeah. She was really good to me and, and helped me build my portfolio and just uh, always complimentary and, you know, always kept hiring me. And then I told the story uh, for those who weren't there, I had a funny experience where I had kind of mentally decided it was just time for me to move on because I was tired of doing financial illustration. I wanted to do something a little a little fresher and, and start pushing my portfolio in other ways because of course I was only going to get ever get hired to do financial illustration if I kept just only showing financial illustration in my portfolio right that just stands to reason and so she enticed me back with one last job and I did not mention to her in any way or give any hint that like hey this is it you know I, I wasn't going to be you know arrogant in that way I, you don't want to come off as pompous but if she was going to call me in the future then I was just going to have to say oh I'm sorry I'm busy and you know figured she'd eventually get the hint and it's like she telepathically felt it or something because i did what i think was my single best job for her and she was super happy with it and she never called me again <laughs> it was just like she somehow she felt it in the water or i don't know you know i, I it'd be fascinating to talk to her now and see if you know may, maybe i accidentally offended her in an email and you know i didn't i never even realized it but it was just like she it was as if she sensed it that yep he's, he's moving on you know it's time for time for him to spread his wings and Go go on to some some different types of clients. Well, it's you know it's it's uh, interesting that there's a tremendous amount of illustration bought for topics that aren't that interesting. Um, yeah, right, right. <laughs> That's a great way to general, yeah, to to the general public. I mean, think of yeah. think of all the success that Sujen has had. Um, um, uh, she's a yeah. facility. And those, like, are yeah, fine, yeah. those are all financial magazines. And her, I you yep. know when when she was speaking with us, she um, really explained it in a beautiful fashion. You know, she convinced her editors or the power at, of that be at uh, I guess marketing editors, the the people at the top at the magazines, yep. that right. she would have much more success with this kind of dry literature, dry articles that if they used and they gave her the budget to hire really great illustrators, really creative solutions that 
yep. it would make it would make the magazine more successful and more financially successful. And uh, she she said that um, I think she said that she's been through three different ownerships in her uh, tenure with the with the magazines, and she mm -hmm. had to convince each and every one, and they all uh, eventually, um, you know, she's still there. And she's yep. she, she is hiring is she probably hires more great illustrators than any one person, uh, any one working person in the industry. Um, I think that's absolutely true. I think she is the one. I mean, like literally, if we were to give an award for who's hiring the most good illustration, I think it's Sujin Bazelli. I don't even, think, yeah. you know, some somebody at the New Yorker is probably the next, you know, closest second, but. Um, right. Yeah, no, I admire what she does, and 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 what you know that story. I've I've heard that before. Um, I know her husband Chris a little bit. I haven't really gotten into Sujin um, well, which is um, a bummer because I really she's on my bucket list of of art directors I want to I want to work with. Um, I think it speaks obviously so well of Sujin and her powers of persuasion that she was able to you know make this case to them but i also just giving credit where credit is due her bosses you know i got to give credit to them too of that you know they were at least willing to to listen to her and 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 give it a try um because the fact that she's been able to pull that off for this many years now is really stunning it's it's a compliment to her and her ability to to fight for quality and uh but it, i also want to you know give it up to her bosses of that hey they they listened to her you know so it's pretty remarkable on, on both ends and Good for her, because what a legacy she's built for herself over there, too, on these dry right. magazines. And for anybody who's listening, going, what are you talking about, sir? Her name's Sujin Buzelli. If you're not familiar with her husband, Chris, he is a fantastic, very, very good illustrator, uh, top-notch illustrator, Chris Buzelli, B-U-Z-E-L-L-I. Super nice guy. I met him for the first time at um, the American Illustration Party in 2017 and freely admitted him of just like, hey, I've, I've just always wanted to meet you, you know, like, and, and just immediately he was so friendly and so accommodating, no no rock star illustrator persona whatsoever. You know, we, we just hit it off great. And I actually was going to host him just a month later in Santa Barbara. He was going to be, he and Sujin were going to be coming through and I was so excited to be able to take him out to dinner and show him the town. And then this little thing called the Thomas fire happened, which was, you know, one of the greatest wildfires in the history of California and completely smoked out the entire town and our foothills were burning. And so, you know, very wisely, they were like, yeah, we got to skip this, you know, this stop on the trip. They, they had to just, you know, keep, keep going right on by. So, um, Anyway, what I was saying, so those who don't know Sujin, um, she works for uh, a group that publishes a number of different, very, very dry, very technical business magazines aimed at different sectors of you know, CEOs and things like that. And her particular genius is that she takes these articles that really, you know, there's got to be a handful of people on the planet that even want to read these articles because they're so technically oriented. And she has an amazing ability to read them and distill them to like, okay, but what's the idea? Like, like what's the, what's the fundamental principle that's at work in this article once you get past all the technical jargon? And then she gives that to her illustrators. So apparently they don't read the article because she doesn't want them, they wouldn't want to anyways, and she doesn't want them getting lost in it. And she, she just gives them, you know, um, overcoming great crisis through creative means you know like that that's the kind of like brief that her artists get from her which i just think is such incredibly smart art direction because then by not letting them know any other details of the article they're really freed up to just think metaphorically and they're not thinking in the typical you know bear and bull market symbols and you know whatnot you know like kind of the tropes of finance and business and so that's where, you know, you might get Yuko Shimuzo and she's doing some amazing illustration of like, you know, butterflies, you know, cascading in a tidal wave or, you know, I'm just making stuff up here, but, you know, something like really innovative and creative. That's what Su Jin gets out of her artists because of um, her really smart art direction. So, yeah, would love to work for her. Well said. All right, let's start adding a little color to this guy. Um, I should note too, guys, that in my in my dream world, I would have done this this illustration start to finish minimum once and maybe twice, right? Like I would have really practiced this thing and then totally lied to you guys and pretended that I didn't. Like that that was definitely part of the plan to just uh, you know make sure I really had this thing 
down and uh, know exactly what I was doing. And the reality is um, I, I was just too busy with too many things to be able to do that. So I am um, trying things out here. And so if all of a sudden you go, oh, okay, that's cool. He's adding some color. And then I completely change it in a minute. It's because I don't really know what I'm doing and I'm making it up as I go along. So I just want to be real transparent about that right now in case I crash and burn on this. But it does feel like it's time to introduce a little color to play off of this uh, surrealistic skin tone I've given the good doctor here. Which means since I'm making it up as I go along, I don't have anything particularly profound to tell you technique wise, because again, this might get erased or, or, or we're done. So any other questions sitting out there, John, whether YouTube no. or Discord? No, we're, we're caught up. Timmy might have one or two, I'm not sure. Okay. Um, but you know, I like the fact that this is um, uh, more intuitive at this point. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I think that's a great way to treat color, uh, it, may, it keeps you. It keeps you. Uh, it keeps the piece fresh. It does for mm -hmm. me anyway. It's like I. I never really try to figure my color out until I start painting. Right. Unless I'm well, there. and also, I'll, I'll go back here and just show what what's partly inspiring my approach here is very specifically. It's this piece. So um, this is just to explain this one real briefly. This was a theater poster I did. Um, I do a pro bono, you know, just for free for my friends at the theater department here at Westmont. I usually do the theater poster for what their late February production is. So this was last year's and it's uh, Moliere has a famous comedy called The Miser. That's about a patriarch and um, him being this miser and his kids and grandkids and whatnot. Um, I can't remember the exact details of the play, but you know, the family is angling to get a hold of his millions, you know, once he, he departs this mortal plane. And so um, something that the um, director did for this particular show that he let me know is he said, hey, you know, we're, we're doing a contemporary take on Moliere's um, The Miser, but really, otherwise, it's, it's pretty straight. We're not like, you know, changing the text or anything. But one change that we are doing is we're, we're gender swapping it. So the, the Miser now the, 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 is, a, is a matriarch. And they were talking about how that was really opening up the play in some very amazing ways because of the fact that um, there, there's like a lot of sexist jokes that are built into that play that then it kind of reveals their sexism and, and offers some commentary on it by you know, sw swapping the roles. And he was actually very clear about the fact that he said, you know, some people might accuse us of like, oh, you know, we're trying to do like a, a woke version or something of the miser. He said, it's not, that's not the, the, that's not the uh, motivating force. The motivating force is they had more women try out than men. <laughs> it was just a, you know, like work with what you got. And they realized, well, wait a minute, if we gender flip the roles, then, then that works perfectly for the amount of women we've got trying out for the roles. So I was just delighted by that twist. I thought, well, that, that's fun. So now maybe, you know, I get to make this kind of high society lady and she looks all mean and, you know, she's hanging on to her money. And, and so this was an opportunity for me to try something new. Cause again, there was not a hint of that annoying thing we call compensation, right? You know, so that will really free you up to try and experiment a little bit. And I was thinking in particular of some of the work your dad did, John, where your dad, I think, was the master, in my opinion, of um, uh, close value work, like work where you're, you're compressed values, where maybe the darkest dark isn't all that dark and the lightest light isn't that light, uh, particularly with handling with faces and whatnot, so that that was kind of a rough jumping off point, as well as some other contemporary artists I'd seen, you know, doing fun work with playing with skin tones and whatnot. And I just seemed like, all right, you know, to play about money, let's play with green tones and um, really give her this kind of blight, bright, blinding, um, you know, white shirt that she's got on and the white of the hat, which I stole from a photo of Meghan Markle. Um, you know, it was just an opportunity to play and try out some different technique things. And yeah, you, the you did a, a, a really terrific job with that. And I, I, you know, I think of, uh, I think of contemporary. I think of Nicholas Uribe, who does that. Oh so yeah, yeah, well totally. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And, and, he really and obviously, does that well. yeah. obviously, Edward Kinsella, who, yep. Um, yep. who, who's a master at it. But uh, yep. as a painter, I think Nicholas Uribe just, it's, it's very, very successful. 
you're right. He is, he's a, uh, like maybe the best contemporary example of that kind of thing of that value compression. So yeah, great example. And somebody whose work I love. So anyway, all this to say, um, if I can, I'm going to drop the lightest of humble brags here. Um, that piece just got awarded by the um, Los Angeles Society of Illustrators. They, they gave it a gold award this year in the advertising category. And so that coupled with some feedback I got from art directors, I, I had an art director actually flat out tell me, he's like, do more work like that. Like in, in this one art director's opinion, he was like, that, that's, that's like, it's the best piece of your portfolio. I, I wanna see more of that from you. So that's been kind of a motivator for, I, I do a lot of realistic skin tone pieces because a lot of times that's what art directors specifically want. But wherever I can now, I wanna try and just you know play around a little bit with monochrome treatments as well as playing around. This one I'm going a little more full value with, but um, yeah, it's just an approach I wanna try out and see where, where it takes me and try and develop that a little bit further, so. Well, that um, piece is very nice. deserving of, of a gold medal, so. You know. Thank you. That's hugely flattering. Thanks, John. I mean, especially to hear from a, a mentor like you is uh, that's really gratifying. So thanks for saying that. And yeah, I mean, that was it's a nice email to wake up to a couple of Sundays ago. You know, if <laughs> you wake up, I'm kind of groggily checking my email as I brush my teeth, and all of a sudden it's a, oh, oh, hey, look at that. Somebody really liked it. And you know what also made that award so special is I was aware of who um, the the judges were, and they had a great panel of of judges, which I say that not because they chose my piece, but because there's some <laughs> legends. I mean, it was it was Anita Coons and Thomas Blackshear, just to name two of them, you know, um, and Francis Vallejo, who's uh, just uh, a friend and I think a, a legend in the making of his own right, you know, just one of the most exciting young illustrators out there right now. So um, pretty, yeah, pretty to, to, to get, yeah, it was, yeah, when you looked at the whole lineup, it was, there were some really good people. So to know that, hey, at least a majority of them liked my work, that that, <laughs> that alone is is pretty, pretty flattering. So that's such um, an interesting, but that, that's such an interesting thing to put, you know, because you think of three people that are, that, that they're, they're all excellent. Anita, uh, mm -hmm. um, Thomas, and Francis, and they, they, they go very different directions. And it's right. so, and it's so cool. And, and it's, and it's so um, encouraging, I think, the first time I saw that was that you could put people that were covered a lot of different ground but they were all great at what they did. But when they were, when they were judging, they were deciding, uh, they all chose very similar uh, pieces. Um, they, they identified the pieces that were the best and there was very little argument or discussion on what they thought. They, the agreement level was very, very high. And, and I, re I remember the first time I saw that, I was like, well, there's something to this. <laughs> there's something mm. to there. There's rights and wrongs in this in, because all these really super talented people that did work that were, you know, on the other side of the stratosphere, but they came together on what was good, and mm. yeah, and I think I cool. think that's a really positive thing that you know that there are rights and wrongs to this, um, and 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 it's obtainable. It's you can you can learn it. It's not acquired knowledge. It's not it's not talent. This is something that, that you can actually acquire. Right. And I should also note too, that, I mean, it also shows too, when, when it comes to these competitions, um, you know, there are some artists where you will see sometimes, I, I think of Brian Stauffer, you know, like the, sometimes he'll post a piece and I'll just sit there going, well, that's going to win a gold medal this year, you know, from whether it's the side of illustrators, Los Angeles or New York or something, it's going to get into every competition. And sometimes you really see that, you know, like where there'll be a certain piece. I'm thinking of, you know, Mark Burkhart and Tim O'Brien and Vic Donai, you know, there'll be just certain work where you just look at it and go, that thing is going to, you know, anything they enter it in, it's, it's going to be startling if it doesn't get in. And yet, even with that, there, I'm sure there were some times where that that sure thing piece doesn't necessarily get in. And so here, that piece that I'm so proud of and really had a blast doing, and then I got this nice honor from the Society of Illustrators Los Angeles. It didn't get in to the Society of Illustrators New York show. Like it just, it didn't, you know, it didn't get in the door, you know, it, it didn't make the cut. So that's one of those where you have to remind yourself, you know, every group of judges is different. 
and your work is not going to please all of them. And so, um, you know, we can be disappointed and not get in in a particular year. You absolutely just have to dust yourself off and just say, hey, so it didn't work for that group. And had it been a different group of judges, for all you know, the piece that got rejected one year might have won a medal. And um, I think they cracked down on this now, so you can't really do this as much. But I know my illustration teachers used to tell me back in the day that they would re-enter pieces sometimes three or four years in a row. And the one um, that really stood out was Jack Unruh told us about um, a piece that he really believed in. And he entered it three times. And the first two times, it got rejected. It just did not get into the show at all. And then the third time, it won a gold medal. <laughs> you know, he was just so convinced, like, no, this is a good piece. Like, I'm going to keep, keep after this one. Nowadays, with their electronic submission system, um, I think there was a year I actually did re-enter something by accident. I had forgotten that I had entered it the year before. And they actually contacted me and said, hey, just so just so you know, like we're we're not, you know, taking this piece. You you already entered it before. And even though I wasn't trying to pull a fast one, I remember thinking then, oh, okay, well, I guess that that era of entering and re-entering pieces may 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 be over now due to the technology. That's too bad. Which is <laughs> it is too bad because no, I honestly do, because I mean, I understand on the one hand, like American illustration in particular, um, that volume, my understanding is that Mark Heflin's, you know, the publisher, his vision for it is he really wants it to serve as a, a true historical record of like, this is a snapshot of what illustration was in 2020. This is a snapshot of what it was in 2021, you know, and and like, I get that. That's that's a lofty and, and, and admirable goal. But I also think that even if we wanted to give it a limit of like, okay, you can re-enter a piece like three times or something. I think there'd be some value in that because it would still be of that era and it would allow for some really good work to get its chance in, in the sun, to get its moment in the sun, because, you know, just in one particular year, you may have had judges in a category that really were all more about flat graphic work and you're an artist who does more rendered stuff, you know, and it's, that's not a slight on the judges. It's just, you know, sometimes there can be a, a grouping where, their tastes do skew more a certain a certain way, you know. And I, I think it'd be great to give work a, a couple of chances with a couple of different juries. And you know, then if you strike out three times, I think at that point you got to just say, all right, <laughs> maybe the piece wasn't as good as I thought it was, you know. So um, anybody observing carefully with my painting technique will notice here a lot of times I'm basically painting with flat color, like when I'm just kind of blocking in areas. And something I'm, I'm trying to push myself on more now, and I just think we're going to run out of time on this demo, unfortunately, is there will come a point where then I will go back in with some maybe hints of blue or hints of purple, you know, try and try and get some kind of color modulation in there just to make it a little bit more complex and a little bit more interesting. And I wouldn't say I do a ton of that, but I, I try to do with that. But there's definitely a point where, you know, trying out colors like this, I'm basically just going to kind of block things in. That'll give me a chance to sit with it, evaluate the value. I can tell overall right now this piece is maybe a little bit darker in overall value than I, I want it to be. So I think another pass on the face is called for and really start to, you know, punch up highlights more and, and make things a little bit bolder. Um, and yeah, I think um, I can't see the clock when I'm in Procreate here, John, but I had checked sure. my phone at one point. It's 7.55. We got about five minutes or so. Okay. Why don't we, let's do one more question as I noodle this thing a little bit more to death and then uh, we'll, we'll call it a night here. Well, I'm waiting for one. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I'm challenging the audience. Come on, okay. hit me, people. I think there's a few people typing. Okay, cool. So um, I have a question for you because I know mm -hmm. how important teaching is to you. Um, and just, but I also know how important this is. Would Would one ever outrun the other? Would you ever, do you ever have the feeling mm -hmm. of just taking off and just doing this all the time? Yeah, I... I'm tempted, you know, um, I, I don't feel right now the illustration editorial market is strong enough to support more than a handful of illustrators full time. And then even if it does support them full time, you are um, you're taking risk because you can be the hottest thing for a couple of years. But then, you know, illustrators do go out of 
fashion, right? You know, and it's not to say that like your work is hokey or horrible or anything, but like if you're really good in editorial illustration, there can come a point where I think you frankly get overexposed, right? Like like art directors won't hire you just for the fact that they're they're so used to seeing you and they want to they want to you know get like a new flavor for their publication. So um, um, so well, all this to say, an illustrator requires change. <laughs> yeah, it requires change and and adapting outlets too. Like um, I think Greg Manchester is such a great example of this, right? Like so here's a guy that was doing, you know, a particular type of illustration. He was doing a lot of portraiture. And then all of a sudden he made a pivot at one point into kind of more like fantasy sci-fi. And he's done that for a while. And then now he's done two sets recently, just in the last couple of years of um, uh, uh, postage stamps, you know, which is lucrative work if you can get it. And last I was, Greg is a good friend. And last time we were chatting, he was telling me like, he's kind of got like an in with the, whoever the, the, postmaster or art director is or whatever like they really I, I get the sense they they like his work and they like him as a person and so he's kind of got an open invitation to keep pitching ideas to them you know so and again you're not going to live off completely off postage stamps but that that's a solid solid project you know to, to have one of those uh, a year or, or more if you're fortunate enough so i do think the illustrators who are making a living and staying busy are the ones who have figured out not just editorial but editorial and some advertising clients, editorial and some fine art stuff. I, I think for me, if I had to pick one artist who I think really summarizes that that level of, of pivot in their work, I think Mark Burkhart is a really strong example of that. I think Yuko right. Shimuzu is a strong example of that. Um, Victo Nye. Yep. Victo has done so many cool, you know, like beer labels and, you know, I mean, just all kinds of cool, you know, uh, Visa credit card campaigns. And those are... Yeah big, big paying jobs where, you know, in some cases they come with a, you know, a ton of work, but then honestly, there are some times where, you know, you get lucky with some advertising illustrations. It's the same amount of work you would have put in on an editorial job with 10 times the payout right? Or, well, or, or, or more, uh, you know, uh, Scott, currently I've been, you just go and look at what uh, Catherine Lamb's doing. Um, oh yeah. Right. Yeah. Catherine's, Catherine's fantastic. producing all over the place. Um, totally. So, and Here's the last question. This is a good good question, and and I'm I'm thank Elena for asking it because it's it it, it, it I, I like the question. It means a lot to me. Um, what's the most valuable thing you learned at the Illustration Academy, Scott? Which mm. mentor influenced you the most? Which what? Which mentor influenced you the most? Oh, well, come on. Now you're asking me to pick among parents. So that's, that's not cool. <laughs> I mean, I respect the question, but I don't know that I can answer that. Um, I, I'll, I'll tell you who did the most. Uh, and, and I'll answer that for you. I think my father did because my father influenced every artist that came and taught at the academy. <laughs> um, yeah, he, so he, so he was kind of the, the grand poopah. <laughs> yeah, I mean... So yeah, just th this is a great note to end on. So yeah, let me just tell like a, an anecdote or two here as I answer this. Um, first of all, um, John said one of the most influential things to me as he took me to the airport from my first um, time at the Academy. And I, I think I, I touched upon this story last time, but it's worth repeating again. Of I was lamenting to him, um, I had gone to Willamette University, a uh, small private liberal arts school up in Oregon and not an art school. And, you know, I mean, I was an art major there, but like, you know, really had not gotten anything near the kind of training I was desiring and, and looking for, and that the Illustration Academy so profoundly provided for me. I mean, it was those yes, no answers I'd been craving for so long. So just my first five weeks there in the summer of 97, you know, just knocked me out. But I was lamenting to John on the, um, as he gave me a lift to the airport, how it was a really humbling experience because there was in particular one student who was considerably younger than me, he was a good five, five years younger than me, who just drew rings around me and really rings around everybody. I mean, this guy was just so talented. He's such an incredible figurative artist. And so I was just noting that like, man, I've got a lot of, I got a lot of work to do. I got a lot of catch up, you know, to play here. I, I, I very much got my eyes open to how much left I have to learn. But then John made a point of complimenting me on um, that I'd had some really good conceptual solutions. So I, you know, and he was saying, hey, listen, technique comes with time to practice. It's an achievable thing, but learning history and literature and this liberal arts background that you had that it is giving you good ideas that's a leg up you've got on on some of these younger artists who are 
maybe more developed in terms of technique, but you're, you've got this other edge on them, so don't discount that. And it was just such a kind thing to say, you know, and um, and and one I think is is true. I mean, I don't think you were just you know blowing smoke at me, but it it was it was something that really encouraged me. So that was a huge one at a point where I was leaving feeling a little down and discouraged, and like that really put a lot of energy for me to kind of get back you know, to, to chasing after it once I got home and continue with my studies on my own for the next year until I could go to the academy again in the summer of 98. So that's one. Um, Brent Watkinson was a huge influence of just so many things. I've just learned so much about color in particular from Brent, um, learned how to really take photo reference from Brent. Um, and I also just think Brent was just such an important voice of in the competitiveness of the Illustration Academy and the, the high pressure that could come with it naturally, just because we're all motivated. We're all trying to do good work. The um, voice Brent was of the guy. <laughs> yeah, and, and the voice of encouragement. You know, I just think Brent was really special at seeing people who who needed a, a verbal hug and making sure they got it. You know, like that that was, I think, his 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 gifting. Um, and then um Gary Kelly for learning how to thumbnail. Um Chris Payne sat down with me one day and showed me how to turn an edge and like just in terms that I finally clicked and I got it and I totally understood it. And then um, Anita Kuntz was uh, also amazing for ideation and, you know, pushing, you know, what, where I was going with sketches as well as also at the right time, Anita could just be counted on to give you that, that dose of encouragement when you needed it. Um, and then, you know, I'm, I'm saving for last year. Yeah. Uh, Mark, um, there were, just came a moment where the where I will always remember about Mark the the I told the joke the last time about how, you know I I got a I posed for a photo with John and um, Mark at the first Illustration Academy and they were both like you know, stone cold with their expressions and I was like smiling like a goofball and how uh, I was so just kind of embarrassed by that but then I got up the courage to tell Mark that story the next summer, and Mark thought that was so hilarious that then he made a point of. Um, grabbing me at one point and saying, hey, it's, it's picture time. We're, we're going to retake that picture, which was so thoughtful and so meaningful. And then I got to work with him at his house as an assistant that summer, just briefly, and helped him shoot some paintings right when a tornado hit. So I went through that experience with him and his family. And there's no question that was kind of a mild, you know, bonding experience of just doing that. And so at the end of all that, I'll just always forget, I will never forget and always remember at the very end of that particular summer, we'd been there for nine weeks. It was the very last night where we we're all about to leave and go the next day. And we had been there for nine weeks, which meant at that point, people were getting really sick of each other. And uh, you know, we were all pretty burned out. But we we went out for drinks one last night at you know whatever the sports bar was. And Mark came out and joined us for a bit. And so he's saying goodbye and everybody is all saying their goodbyes to him and everything, knowing, you know, this is it. We're, we're not seeing him again. You know, it's, it's goodbye. Everybody's getting on a plane or driving home tomorrow. And he turned right at the door and he made eye contact with me and gave me a wink. And it was just that little extra special, like, hey, bud, I see you, you know, and I just like, I can remember my body, like <laughs> the charge of electricity going through it of like, my hero sees me, <laughs> my, my hero just gave me the little, you know, the cool guy, you know, tip of the hat, like, you know, hey, bud, you know, I got you. It was just so meaningful. I just loved it. And so, yeah, I always, always remember that that particular memory was so sweet. Well, well Scott, I thank you for bringing those things up. Um, and you, you, uh, <laughs> you certainly have uh, gone above and beyond uh, with uh, go first uh, in engagement as a student and then as a friend and a colleague and um, it's been a, it's been a really great experience um, you got you you have the physical skills and you got the soft skills to go with it so I I really really appreciate it oh thanks John I appreciate you saying that um, anyway um I'm going to thank thank you for the great three weeks. This has been very informative. You are a tremendous speaker and a great explainer of what you do. So thank you for taking the time yeah. and so prepared. And everybody, have a have a great week. Uh, we will be back. I got this uh, this guy named Raymond Bonilla who's going to do a talk with us uh, on the 6th. Oh, uh, okay. Well, I'll be there. I'll be tuning yeah. in. So will I. <laughs>
<laughs> well, yeah, but you're 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 paid to. You're contractually obligated. I'm going to be there because I love. Well, actually, Ray. we're not. <laughs> so. <laughs> All right, everybody, have a, okay. have a wonderful week. And Scott, thank you so much. It's been it's been a treasure.